So we're going to move on to Arabic philosophy. Okay. Let me get my outline here. And we are uh, down here. Uh, again, Arabic philosophy is philosophy done in the language of A Arabic. Okay. And, um, and what Arabic philosophy very much overlaps with is a kind of rational theology. And, and the Islamic scholars were, uh, of course, very interested in theology. You know, you have the rise of the caliphate and this great imperial success. They sort of overrun all these countries and have this um, high technology, high standard of living going on. And uh, as they begin to develop uh, higher learning in this environment, uh, you know, many of these scholars were just, you know, less than 200 years out from the day that Muhammad first heard the revelation of, of Gabriel, you know, um, they're part of this revolutionary movement. And so uh, thinking theologically seems very uh, natural within this context, but then little by little, as they begin to discover texts and translate them into Arabic, um, uh, you know, they hit upon Aristotle and Aristotle really changes uh, the way that they think about theology so much so that it, it kind of diverges from theology and, and really becomes something independent of theology. Uh, and we'll see this theme sort of play out repeatedly in, in the philosophical sources that we're, we're going to cover and most notably in you know, the section on of uh, the course on liberation theology, liberation theology, okay, it's theology, and, and then uh, Enrique de Selle, he is somewhat of a liberation theologian. He doesn't shy away from doing theology, uh, but he wants to uh, really move into a philosophy of liberation, not a theology of liberation, but a philosophy of liberation that's inspired by theology, but is really quite distinct from it. So um, it's interesting to see that kind of play out in uh, the early decades of the, or the early centuries of the Islamic empire. Um, so Plato and Aristotle, the big two philosophers, all the, you know, the people and groups mentioned here are interested in Plato and Aristotle um, and want to incorporate it into their theology or really develop something, you know, genuine philosophy um, in one way or another. So we have this, this school called the Mutazila school. Um, you know, and I don't know if I'm gonna pronounce any of these names correctly. Okay, um, we just do the best we can. And uh, for a period from 833 to 851, this was the official theology of the caliphate. And theologians who did not adhere to this theology, uh, you know, were persecuted, sometimes even executed. Um, and there's kind of three things that this school of thought is based upon that the human, the individual human is free. They have free will as often is talked about amongst Christians. Uh, so they're free to choose their actions. Um, and they, you know, set down as a, a basic principle that the Quran, the book of the Quran, the holy book of Islam was created. It didn't exist eternally. So it had a creation. God created it as an artwork. Um, and then their way of thinking in this way is that uh, it provides a, 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 a theodicy, what will later become called theodicy, which is an explanation or a, an argument against the problem of evil. The problem of evil is, okay, you say that God is omnipotent, he's all powerful, and you say that God is 
uh, all-knowing, omniscient, and you say that God is uh, uh, purely beneficent. He's he's all good. So, if God is all good and all powerful, then why do bad things happen? And why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in the world if God is so powerful and loving? Uh, and that's just a problem that occurs, especially once you get into monotheism, when there's just one God. You know, if there's multiple gods, okay, maybe the gods are playing off of each other, blah, blah, blah. But if there's one God, it's like, and they're supposed to be all powerful, then why don't they just stop evil from happening? This is where human freedom comes in, okay? And so the Mutazil uh, school, uh, you know, explains that, okay, humans are free, and so they get to choose, and, and that's part of the thingness of God, is that he gives you the choice to do evil. And so evil comes from humans. Okay. Uh, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, just a, just a generation later, we have Al-Kindi, uh, Al and he's known as the father of Arab philosophy. Okay, so now he, and, and the Mutazila were very much theological and didn't have a lot of pretense to philosophy, but they had rational arguments to back up their theology. It wasn't pure faith or just do what the book says or do what the Imam says. Um, they had arguments. And so that's what makes it rational was they have some argument. Uh, Al-Kindi thought about, okay, rational arguments and actually began to study Aristotle and Plato and look at their ar argumentation and that, and, and then actually may adopt more of their approach to things. And that's what makes him the father of Arab philosophy. Uh, he worked at the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. So Baghdad is, was, uh, is the capital of modern day Iraq. And the House of Wisdom uh, was, uh, a learning institution set up by the the caliph and and um, and and that's really the beginning of universities and this is in 800 AD uh, long before the European universities now Al-Kindi uh, although he claimed to use Aristotle as a source was more of a Neoplatonist. And so he interpreted or maybe got Aristotle secondhand through Neoplatonists, uh, but his ideas are very Neoplatonist. Uh, and Neoplatonism is a later development after Aristotle and Plato, uh, a century or two after uh, the death of Plato. You get Neoplatonism, which becomes synchronized, uh, syncretic with a lot of religious uh, thinking that was going on around the Mediterranean and becomes a kind of cos uh, cosmopolitan uh, sort of philosophy of, of people that are experiencing lots of multicultural interaction with people all around the Mediterranean and, and trying to see ways in which you kind of unify all these different cultural perspectives, religious perspectives and philosophical perspectives. And is there some underlying sort of unity to all that? And the Neoplatonists had a story about that, which was pretty compelling for people at the time. And so it was a very popular uh, sort of philosophy. Uh, and, and in many ways, Christianity is an outgrowth of Neoplatonism. It's, at certain points, it's hard to distinguish between Neoplatonism and Christianity. So this is one of the key sources of Christianity. Um, <clears throat> and I should say too that um, in Islam, Christianity is one of the sources, and I've mentioned this before, they're all part of this Abrahamic uh, tradition. And um, what many students don't realize is that Jesus himself, uh, so Jesus of Nazareth is considered a prophet of Islam. It's just that some of the things that Christians believe about Jesus, Muslims don't. So they have a different interpretation of Jesus. And, um, and so 
uh, just as Neoplatonism is very close to Christianity, Christianity is very close to Islam, uh, you know, all these things just, it just depends on looking at it from different angles, you know, but it's kind of the same conversation going on. And so that's a good explanation as to why Neoplatonism would play so largely in uh, Islamic philosophy. Okay. So, uh, and Al-Kindi then argued that God, the, the creator, thinking of, of Allah as creator of the universe, uh, was the final and efficient cause of the universe. But he's really thinking of God as kind of a, a craftsperson who's creating a, a, like a piece of art, like my daughter creating a gingerbread house, okay? Um, God creates the universe. Okay, and, um, and, it, and, it, and God is the purpose for the universe and God is what, you know, works upon things to make the universe come into being in the first place. Uh, and he also argued that metaphysics is theology. Okay, and, and Neoplatonism is very metaphysical and Neoplatonism is, is, very much theology, but in a very abstract way. But then again, Islam is very abstract because you know, in Islam you don't you don't attribute uh, qualities to God um, other than you know uh, things like all wise, all knowing, uh, all things. But uh, but uh, you don't want to attribute to God like even. Uh, you know, like a hairstyle or something like that. You know, and there's no pictures of Allah in Islam, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and Neoplatonism is kind of like that. They, they think of God as the one, the kind of source of everything, the one. Um, and so uh, this all, you know, kind of fits. But uh, metaphysics is theology, okay. And then the Ash'ari school uh, comes from uh, Ash'ari, one of the, the, the founding philosopher of this school. And now we start to get into some very Aristotelian uh, thinking. Um, Ash'ari and maybe he himself, but is the school that developed in, in the wake of his prominence, they developed this notion of occasionalism. And so I remember I said back here that, that the Mutazila, they argue that the Quran was created, that it's a work of art for, of God. Um, Ashari's, they argued that the Quran was not created because God is all knowing. God always knew the contents of the Quran. Now we're not thinking about the physical book, we're thinking about the content of the book. The, the, not even like the words on the page, or thinking about the meaning, what it means. Um, that's the real Quran. And, uh, you know, if you make up a story, even if you don't write it down, you still make it up. You're creating it. But their, their argument was that God, he didn't, make, he didn't make the Quran up at some point in time. He always knew the Quran. Okay, so God always knew the Quran, and so it always existed um, in God. Okay. So they're thinking in a less linear fashion. And that's one thing about Aristotelianism is that in order to really understand it, you have to think in not so linear terms. And Scheidler, you know, makes a big point of this is that this um, tyranny of linear thinking, um, that's part of the legacy of modernism that we're dealing with in our culture right now is this linear thinking, thinking that everything has to happen. Well, something happened first, then something, then that, 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 that. And everything kind of progresses on a very predictable 
non-diverging path. Um, but with Aristotle, he's not thinking that linearly in the way that, that uh, Scheidler speaks of. Um, and so things can be you know, thought of on an eternal basis where maybe it's even out of time. Like time could just be uh, an expression of the nature of the universe. Um, not that, and not thinking that time exists in and of itself. And that's one of the modern um, sort of notions in philosophy is that there's, there's time and then there's, there's atoms and, and there's space. And, you know, and then we imagine all this stuff moving around. Okay. Um, but Aristotle isn't thinking that way. And, 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 you know, as I mentioned, you know, that, that whole model is starting to break down in our society right now. So, um, so with Asharis, they're, they're not thinking in linear terms like we normally do with normal causation. They're thinking in terms of Aristotelian causation. It's very, you know, hard for us to wrap our minds around. But this occasionalism is very interesting because it says that God creates each change in the qualities of the universe. So every time something changes in the universe, God is specifically creating that change each and every moment. So if I bend my finger like this, God is doing this each and every second, each and every millisecond, every single moment, every single change. God is specifically ordering everything. He's programming everything. Um, and so, now that becomes a problem because that means that humans are not free. So this is very contrary to the Mutazil uh, sort of way of thinking. And if God's controlling, as God is making me do something, how can I be held morally responsible for something that God is doing? And so this creates uh, another sort of weird inflection of the problem of evil. If I do something evil, how can I be blamed for what God is doing, making me do? God made me do it. It's not the devil that made me do it. It's God made me do it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not clear on, on how this, how the problem of evil is explained away within this school, but it has something to do with the, the idea that, that uh, the person who commits evil acquires the action, the act, uh, in some way, it becomes part of their person, or part of their nature, maybe, um, in this Aristotelian way, but uh, it doesn't quite compute for me. Okay, so that, that's really problematic. Okay. Um, okay, and then, so now we're moving a little later. Notice now we're into 936 uh, with Ashari. Now we're past the time of Charlemagne. You know, we're like a hundred years after Charlemagne. Okay, and then, uh, but, you know, Charlemagne and the, you know, his scholars and everything in his court don't really know anything about all this Islamic philosophy that's going on. I mean, some of them they do, but it's not really penetrating the consciousness of Europe. Uh, and then we get to like 950, you know, so, so now we're getting into the, you know, the high medieval period of Europe. Um, and, and we have, uh, we have, uh, the Crusades are just about to start up. And so just in the decades before the Crusades start, uh, Farabi uh, becomes prevalent as a philosopher in Baghdad. And he's known as the second teacher. So Aristotle's the first teacher and Al-Farabi is the second teacher. So he's like the big dog of um, Arabic philosophy. And he understands metaphysics as the study of being, not necessarily as theology. So 
metaphysics isn't just about God. Metaphysics is about being in general. And of course, God is a being, but what metaphysics is about is the study of the very concept of being. Um, and he, again, is very Neoplatonic, um, and so his Aristotelianism is a little off. Uh, it's more Neoplatonic, but he does, make, um, he does make a lot of reference to Aristotle, and it does seem like some of his ideas are genuinely, um, genuinely connected to the thinking of Aristotle. Uh, you know, God is at rest in perfect contemplation. Okay, that sounds like Aristotle. Uh, but this emanation uh, of God through a chain of less pure self-contemplating spirits, you know, that's the sort of origin story of the universe uh, that Al-Farabi gives. That's very Neoplatonic. That's like the one sort of overflows with being and creates uh, the next level of things which are still similar to the one but on a lower level and and this is all uh, very neoplatonic um, and you know it is also mixed together with christianity you know i talked about the nature of christ before you know is he all god or is he all human or is he some mixture or you know how do you make that all work um, the Neoplatonists had an answer for that, you know, and so it's about emanations, that Jesus was an emanation of God the Father. Uh, and, or, or maybe even God the Father is an emanation of the Holy Spirit. And then, you know, so it's this sort of waterfall effect. Um, um, and Al-Farabi, you know, adopts this kind of thinking in some way. But he does think of God as perfectly at rest and not the active creator like the artisan or, or, or worker like my daughter making a gingerbread house. That's not the way that God made the universe. God has a physis, has a nature, and just out of the nature of God, the universe emerges <clears throat> uh, through this emanation process, okay, uh, which is kind of an interesting idea and has similarities, you know, to uh, maybe some Indian uh, Hindu way of thinking. Uh, so there's lots of interesting world religions kind of questions uh, to, to think about there. All right. And I think what I'll do is I'm gonna I'm going to stop the recording here and then and then do a new one so we can just kind of break it up into manageable chunks. <clears throat>